We are at the Veterans Affairs Medical Center in Riviera Beach, Florida, and um, my name is Carlton Cartwright. I'm the Executive Director with the Children's Coalition Incorporated, and I also have um, one of my students with me, Gervonta, last name? Gibson. Gibson, uh, who, um, who's attending Riviera Beach Preparatory Academy. Is that the whole name? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're here interviewing um, Van Williams. And um, Van, uh, what is your address? Uh, 2402 Bellarosa Circle. And what is your birthday? 12-2-1967. Okay, and what branch of the service were you in? U.S. Army. Okay, what was your rank when you got out? Sergeant E-5. Okay, and uh, what wars did you serve in? I uh, served during uh, Operation uh, Desert Storm and uh, can do Iraqi Freedom. Um, because I was never deployed though. Okay, you start there. Okay. Were you? Were you drafted or did you enlist? Enlisted. Where were you living at the time? Uh, Savannah, Georgia. Why did you join? Uh, I was teaching uh, junior high school. Uh, didn't really like it. Um, had a family, so uh, I decided to not teach any longer. So the military was the best option at the time, uh, where I could uh, earn a salary, and benefits, and that gave me credit for being for being a college graduate. So I went in as an E4. Do you call the first days in your service? Absolutely. Uh, and well, if you're talking about the receptions battalion all into basic training. Mm -hmm. um, my first duty station was a place called Sierra Army Depot in Herlong, California. Um, and uh, it was a uh, nuclear facility. And uh, you had to be in this program called the Personnel Reliability Program in order to participate um, because you handled items uh, sensitive to national security. It wasn't what I expected as my first duty station uh, because basically we guarded bunkers all day. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Why, why did you choose that branch of the service? Uh, I, I really I chose the Army because uh, for the most part it was, they gave me the most rank because I'd already been to college. Uh -huh. And I know I, I wasn't going to make it a career. Mm -hmm. So I took the Army's E-4 over the Air Force's E-3 mm -hmm. um, instead. Okay. <laughs> wow. What did it feel like? Well, it was different. Um, of course, having been to college and mm -hmm. pledged fraternities and all those kinds of things and had my own family, uh, some of the kind of uh, strong tone, tonation you get from uh, platoon sergeants and, and uh, squad leaders didn't really affect me that much because, you know, again, I'd already been in the world. I was a grown man. I wasn't a kid right out of high school in the military. Okay. Um, so with that being said, tell me about your boot camp and training experience. Uh, uh, I thought it was a good experience. Um, mm -hmm. I was already in really good shape, but I got in even better shape while I was there. Um, you learn a lot about yourself um, from the standpoint of uh, um, how you can push your body to what limits. Um, I have to say that the whole boot camp experience, well, in the Army's basic training, uh, is supposed to be about tearing you down and, and building you back up. I can honestly say that I don't think that happened. Um, you know, again, I think that it's more geared toward a kid coming right out of high school who haven't had any experiences in life. I was 24 years old when I went in, so I already had some experiences in life. So some of the kind of games they play, you know, and I just played the game. Okay. Do you remember your <clears throat> Do you remember your trust instructors? Instructors. Instructors. I'm so sorry. Well, I, remember, I remember a great deal of them. Um, my platoon sergeant was uh, Staff Sergeant Johnny Alaho, mm -hmm. and uh, we, we're talking about over 23 years ago. I still remember his name like it was yesterday. Um, and then my subsequent platoon sergeant was Dale Kane. Persian. Go ahead. Okay, Dale Kane. Persian. And uh, he was the uh, platoon sergeant uh, by the time I met to uh, AIT, which is Advanced Individualized Training. Okay. So how did you get through the whole boot camp experience, the whole experience? Basically do what you're told. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty regimented. You don't have to do a lot of thinking as far as, you know, getting up at, you know, old dark 30, going to run PT, uh, unlike, you know, the Air Force to ride bicycles. 
You know, we got one, no pun intended. <laughs> we got to ride bicycles. <laughs> we got to run two miles or uh, more um, every morning. And it just became, you know, the regiment that I had to get accustomed to for 18 weeks. Um, so, I mean, there were some challenges physically and learning the military apparatus, you know, firing rifles and um, throwing hand grenades and those kinds of things. So it was, it was one of those just like going to school and just was learning something different. Which war did you serve in? World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, or pursuing golf? Uh, I served, I served during the Persian Gulf War. Okay, Persian Gulf, okay. Okay, exactly where did you go? Uh, my no, like I said before, my first duty station was uh, Sierra Army Depot in Herlon, California. Uh, subsequently, I then ETS, not ETS, but I PCS to uh, Germany, uh, Nuremberg, Augsburg, uh, Kaiserslautern, and uh, Ansbach, Germany. Okay. Uh, Keep, yeah, was well, that? Go ahead. Places that was uh, stationed. And at the basic train, where did you go for basic training? Uh, Fort McClellan, Alabama, which so, is now closed. Okay, and where did you go for tech school? Same place. For, as an MP, you have what's known as one station unit training. So you do your AIT your basic and your AIT at the same location. So you were an MP? Yes. How long was your basic training? How long was it? Total 18 weeks. And the, uh, the tech school for MP? Well, everything was together. Oh, everything. 18 weeks. Okay, so immediately... Six weeks was basic, the rest was um, tech school. Mm -hmm. Immediately after that, you went to Germany? I went to California. Where? After basic training in, AI, in AIT. Uh-huh. You I were was stationed in California? Stationed in California. And where was that again? Uh, Sierra Army Depot mm -hmm. in a place called Herman, California. How long were you there? Uh, I was there for a little less than 18 months. Okay, and, and what was it like? How was the food, anyway? How was the food, period? Well, I mean... Talking about army food and the cafeterias or the mess halls, I mean, it's, it's food. Uh -huh. I, mean, I can't, uh, it's, it's not uh, Ruth Chris. Um, it, it did what it was supposed to do. You get a heavy dose of Chili Mac, I can say that. Uh -huh. I ate Chili Mac quite a bit in those first 18 months um, and uh, basic and AIT. Um, but for the most part, um, I didn't stay in, in, the, uh, in the barracks, so, you know, I was commissary, I was buying my own food, so. Right. You know, and um, how were the people around the base? What did you do for entertainment? Well, uh, this place was lo located um, in the Sierra Mountain Valley Range, which basically was in the higher elevations of California, about, I think, two and a half hours from Lake Tahoe. Uh, so you, if you didn't hunt, ski, uh, or into the outdoors, uh, basically the rest of us just went into Reno, which is 45 minutes, Reno, Nevada. And we went to circuit circuits, to casinos and those kinds of things and have fun that way. But uh, there was really no fun to be had, to be quite honest, on the installation. Uh -huh. um, it did have a you know, a little movie theater. Um, and uh, I played post basketball, football, and baseball. So that was my fun. Okay. Yeah, communicate. Okay. How did you stay in touch with your family? Uh, for the most part, um, when I'm stateside, it's going via the phone. Uh, a few letters here and there. Uh, once I went to uh, Germany, obviously that becomes an expensive proposition to call, so there were a lot of letters. Um, and did, I did call when it was uh, convenient to call. Okay. Did you have plenty of supplies? Uh, when you say supplies, uh, as, a, as, a, as a basic... Hygiene. As everything. A hygiene. Did you have everything that you needed? Uh, well, you know, you don't know what you need until after the fact. <laughs> right, you right. Know, you, you just have necessities. Okay. Um, now, would I have enjoyed, you know, a better bar of soap? Of course. Um, would I have enjoyed better linen on my bed? Of course. But, you know, it got the job done. True, true. Did you feel any pressure or stress? I mean, you do. Uh, because sometimes it's just the fear of the unknown itself um, that could uh, bring about a certain amount of stress. Um, the only time I really felt some stress was uh, uh, doing the uh, night infiltration course. Basically doing this course, it's nighttime. You don't notice at the time, but there is a, a, uh, an M60, not an M60, but a, no, what is that, uh, the 50 cal. Oh, the 50 cal machine gun is on this pedestal. 
and it's at an angle, but basically, you know, you see trace arounds, but it's so far above your head, but you don't know that. You think that you're in the red line of fire. And so as you're low crawling, so that, that one night kind of <laughs> uh, But aside from that, I can't think of any other times where I felt that um, the stress was so um, uh, heavy that I couldn't take on responsibilities that was being placed upon me. I had quite a few uh, leadership positions in the uh, basic training uh, realm. I was squad leader, platoon sergeant, and the uh, student first sergeant. So, um, because I, you know, I was one of the older guys in the entire company, so um, I got a chance to be in those leader positions because once I left there, they knew that I would go to a gating unit and people were going to expect me to be on top of my game, being an E4, you know, one rank from being an NCO. So where did you go after Herlong? Herlong. Mm -hmm. uh, after Herlong, California, I went to uh, the 793rd MP Battalion in Nuremberg, Germany. Uh -huh. And about four or five months later after arriving there, the uh, battalion basically deactivated. And then we reflagged. My company was the 218th Military Police Company. And then we reflagged under the 18th uh, MP Battalion. I'm sorry, 18th MP Brigade. And that was out of where? Stuttgart, Germany. Okay, all right. So well, how long were you at that duty station? Uh, a little less than three years. Okay, and did you, well, okay, when you were in California, you said you went to Reno. Where else did you go while you were there? Did you travel anywhere else? Did you go home on leave? Um, what did you do? Yeah, I went home a couple times, yeah. Joe coast to coast twice, so that's I saw every state in the United States except wow. Alaska. Okay. Um, now. Um, and Alaska? Except for Alaska. Oh, okay. That's the only place I haven't been. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, went down to San Francisco, Monterey, Sacramento, uh, LA, um, went a little bit north uh, to Ogden, uh, well, Eugene, I'm sorry, Eugene, Oregon. Okay. Uh, did you go to Utah? Yeah. Ogden? With the Ogden, but not while I was, uh, I did that on one of my trips back and forth to the East Coast. Okay. Yeah. yeah but that was while you were in the service, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm asking this, all the places you travel. That's when we, we go to Europe. I may ask you that. You know, all the places you were. So when you were in Europe, where did you go besides the base? Um, everywhere in Germany. You can, you can drive anywhere in Germany in a car in one day. Mm -hmm. It's the size of the state of New York. Right. Um, so every place in Germany I've been. Um, and Aus uh, Berlin, Austria, Austria, Berlin, Berlin, yep. Berlin, Austria, Czech Republic, uh, I, think. Uh, I, think that's, I think that's, I think that's it. Okay. Yeah. Did you oh, get? Um, Belgium. Belgium. Okay, so you went to Germany, Belgium, Austria. Um, Czech Republic. Czech. And. Uh, that's it. No France or Sweden or no Amsterdam, no. Italy. We had a lot of guys go over to Amsterdam and get in trouble for obvious reasons, but I never went. <laughs> Did you deploy anywhere while you were in, in uh, Europe? We were basically on the lockdown um, to be deployed to the Middle East, but we didn't go. Okay. Um, main reason was because you know we were in a, we were a specialized role in California. And uh, it would have basically understaffed the facility in terms of our protection that we were, were sent there to provide um, at the, uh, the nuclear facility. And then once I got to Germany, we uh, were again slated to go to, uh, to the Gulf. And uh, within two weeks of going, we, they, did not, they decided not to send my, my unit. You know, once you get to the point where you lock down the company area, you can't go home. We was at that point. Okay. We didn't get deployed. Okay. Um, what is uh, what is your next question? What did you go? <clears throat> what did you go on to do as a career after the war? No. -uh. No, I'm no. so sorry. I'm so sorry. What the next duty base? Oh, the next duty base. Um, did you call the day your service ended? No. Mm -mm. We want. What was his next duty base? Yeah, my next, my next duty base. Oh, I'm sorry, what was the next duty base? Uh, from, Germ from Germany, uh, I extended for six months so I could uh, eat uh, PCS to back to the States so I could get out of service in the, in the States and look for a job at the same time. So I went to Fort Lee, Virginia, and I was a part of a triple nickel uh, 555th MP company. 
and I stayed there for a little less than a year. Um, and then I uh, ETS from there back home to Savannah, Georgia. Okay. Um, how was the food in Germany? Uh, with, uh, with the military food, you know, it was just like military food everywhere else. But the food on the economy was kind. exquisite. I had a ball there. I, I, I actually still have a, an affinity for Germany today. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the cleanest places I've ever gone in my life. Uh, the food was just wonderful. Um, people have a different sense of uh, having a meal um, on the German economy. It's more about the company and less about the food. Mm -hmm. um, I, I did learn to speak the language conversationally while I was there. Um, but um, I don't have any bad things to say about my time in Germany. Okay, how did the, how did the people say so you said you learned the language? Did you make a lot of friends? I did. I still have uh, most of my friends. Um, in the German economy were Polizei, which is the German police. Gotcha. And uh, I still have a couple friends, Lance and Steve, to this day. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't talked in a while, um, but for a while we was exchanging emails, letters, phone calls, um, and I'm looking forward to hopefully going back to Europe this year. Skype is cheap. Yeah, but I, I kind of lost, you know, <laughs> lost contact with him before the Skype came even came on. Mm -hmm. Right. Talking about, I've been out, this is, you see, I would have retired three years ago, so okay. we're talking about 23 years right. from my initial enlistment. Gotcha. And so, you know, in that time, Skype is a recent phenomenon. Gotcha. <laughs> I hear you. Yeah. Okay. Um, where we at? All right. No, we're not going to. All right. Did you, um, uh, what did you do for entertainment? Did you, oh, did you go and leave while you were in Europe? Um, I didn't go on leave. In, when I went on leave while I was in Europe, I came back to the States. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, what, did, what did you do for entertainment? Uh, in Europe? Yeah. Uh, if there wasn't something going on on post, like a concert or someplace in Germany, um, we basically barbecued and played dominoes with each other families on the weekends. Right. That was a big source of entertainment for us. Okay. okay. Did you live on the economy? I now lived on base. Lived on base? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I live in the community. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Uh, did you keep a diary? I did. It's in my head. Did you see any combat at all? No. Uh, did, did you or any of your peers, including officers, with this question, um, have any service related injuries? I don't. I know people who. Um, say they had service with in injuries, um, you know, from knees to back pains and those kinds of things. Um, to date, you know, knock on wood, I don't have any. <laughs> good, to, good to go. Okay. Um, that I can link back to my service anyway. I mean, obviously, if you talk, think about all the running and push ups and sit ups and stuff you do, at some point, I'm pretty sure, you know, that as I get older, that may become a problem for me. But mm -hmm. as of this very moment, um, I don't feel like I have any service connected injuries. Okay. All right. Um, go ahead. Do you recall the day your service ended? Yes, I do. Where were you? Uh, when my service ended, I was in Petersburg, Virginia. What were you thinking about as you came up on separating? Well, I had a job before I got out. Um, I, was, I went to work at Savannah State University. And uh, so my whole thought was, you know, transitioning back to civilian life. Um, my mother <coughs> had recently passed, uh -huh. so um, those thoughts were heavily on my mind. Um, but I'm just kind of reflecting on how I was going to apply some of my skill sets from the military to my civilian life, and I think that I've been able to do that to some to some extent. What what kind of job did you have waiting for you? Or did educator. You... Hmm? Edu educator. Teaching. Yeah. And, and what and where were you teaching? In university? At Savannah State. It was Savannah State College then. Mm -hmm. And um, I was also working in a program uh, called Educational Talent Search, which is a federal program uh -huh. um, for kids uh, in high school. Um, that's what I did there as well. Okay, so you had your bachelor's degree when you went into service? I had my, I had my master's by the time I left the service. By the time you left? Yeah. So you um, used the GI years. Bill? No, um, I didn't take the GI Bill because I went in with a bachelor's. Okay. So I elected to just uh, just go in. Didn't think I was going to go to graduate school. Uh, while I was in, I went to University of Oklahoma and got a master's degree. 
Uh, and while I you were overseas? Most of that myself, yeah. Uh -huh. um, and then the, the uh, I wrote a letter to Sam Nunn, Senator Sam Nunn, who was on the uh, the Senate Arms Committee, right? Saying you know you know they need to provide uh, funding for enlisted soldiers who want to get masters. They had it for officers, but they didn't have it for us. Uh -huh. Then the subsequent semester, they were paying for I think it was two thirds of um, your credits. Um, and then you had to pay for the rest. Mm -hmm. So when I separated the military, I had a master's degree. Okay, all right, I just want to make sure this is sharp. Which it is, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay, um, so did you use the GI Bill for anything at any time? Nope. Okay. Nope. So you just paid for it on your own, so. Okay, um, so you had your master's degree when you came out of the service. Which made you, I guess I'm sure that, that was made you eligible to teach uni at university. I was, I was teaching when I was in the Army at Central Texas College. I was teaching law enforcement. Really? Yeah, so I did For that. the military? Not for the military, for Central Texas College. Oh, on a part-time basis? Right, part-time basis. After, 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 after your regular job? Right. Right. Okay, you were an MP totally all the way through the yeah. military? I was wondering if you changed career field. I didn't. Okay. And so what were you teaching? Um, law enforcement. Law enfor you were teaching law enforcement. Okay. All right. So uh, when you separated, you're still teaching. Now you did it full time. Yep. Same. Um, you know, you teach. I mean, once you get a vocation in a certain areas, social sciences, you kind of bounce around a little bit. You know, you might be political science, might be sociology, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then I went into program management, where basically I was managing rent programs. I mean, teaching part time. Me so. Teach what, what like kind of program? Like the program I was telling you about, Educational Talent Search. Uh -huh. It's a uh, it's a program. I manage the program. Uh, what you say? It was called rent. What was it called? No, I said program management. Okay, yeah. all right. Yeah. And uh, so basically, I was managing high school students who were trying to go to college, mm -hmm. helping them get the skill sets and get their good test scores such that they can go to college. So it was, it was a, I, I'm, I know it was a certified or what do you call it? It was bona fide curriculum, but it was really more like a mentoring. Um, kind of, sort of, yeah, mm -hmm. because the curriculum was based in the school. Curriculum based, yeah. of course, yeah. But you were mentoring uh, individuals to go beyond. That's, that's excellent. Okay. Um, so uh, you have continued your close friendships. Did you join any veteran organizations? I did. I was a part of the uh, um, American Legion for a while. Um, I, they, they sent me something I'm like, like almost monthly now for membership. But other than that, that was the only thing I ever joined. Okay. All right. Um, so, I wanted to ask him that. What did you go on to do as a career after the war? Well, I've been in basically education, you know, for uh, 15 of the last. Uh, 18, uh, 15 or the last 18 years. Mm -hmm. um, I did spend a stint in um, state government where I was a lead investigator for civil rights for the state of Florida. Okay. Um, but that's pretty much what I've been doing. Okay. So, so um, after uh, that was, what university was it? Southern? Um, was yeah, first. you said that was Savannah State? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How long were you there? A uh, little less than two years. And then I went to Florida State University after that. Mm -hmm. I uh, stayed at Florida State for two years, then I went to Florida A&M University, stayed there for five years, <laughs> left Florida A&M, uh, went to state government, stayed there for five years, the state government came to Palm Beach, I've been down here for four years. Okay, all right, all right, excellent. Um, and teaching different curriculums or the same? Um, well, yeah, it's same, it's very same area, but um, I mean, there's some barriers, but you know, same area, same general, general education areas. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. All right. Go ahead and ask him that one. Did your military experiences influence your thinking about the war or about the military in general? Um, certainly. I mean, it, it, it influences your thinking, you know, because no matter what your political feelings are about war and, and uh, the threat of war, um, first and foremost, you think about the people who are already taking up arms in defense of the country and staying in harm's way. Um, that's always my first thought. I mean, my political and personal views are secondary to those people who are here standing in line, staying the post, and holding a weapon in defense of the country. Um, the, um, I'm curious, as far as, actually this is more of a um, back to the mentoring, because obviously you've done a lot of that. 
So, uh, two, I've actually got two questions for you. What is, your, what is your advice as far as getting more students involved in the um, government? Really, I want to say politics, but I mean as far as their, their awareness, <clears throat> peaking their awareness or, or bringing them um, to a place where uh, they, they can become more actively involved in, in the political arena. Um, you know, you can get a government job, you know what I mean, working for a government agency, but I mean as far as this peaking or tweaking their interest, drawing them into, again, you know, the political arena, what do you suggest? I'm, it sounds like you've had, you, you seem to be a good person to ask because uh, you've been involved educationally, you've been involved in the military, and you also, for, for a certain amount of time, were involved in state government. So what, what is your opinion? Well, I think, uh, obviously, from the standpoint of service, um, um, I, think, I think everybody should have the benefit of service, to be quite honest. Mm -hmm. um, from the standpoint of you know, being politically active, um, I think a person can be as politically active as they want to, but what they have to do is they have to educate themselves. Um, they can't depend on um, the 24-hour news cycle to be their only platform for information. They have to do their own investigation. They have to do their own thought processes. They have to come up with their own opinions and not be given their opinions by the media. Um, and then if you really want to actively you know, seek a political career, you, know, you just got to know that everything you've done up until that point is an open book. Um, so if you feel like you want to be politically, politically active, you got to make sure that you're squeaky clean because okay. those things come back to uh, haunt you. Um, the voting issue, you know, and, and that's, yeah, being a political figure is one, one part of that, without a doubt. And the other issue today, it seems as though, it's, it seems as though in our last election you had a lot of young people involved, but generally, overall, uh, I, I've, uh, heard, I've heard a lot of complaints about young people not being involved. So, um, and one of the things I, I also heard was, um, you know, having political figures come and visit them, and you know, that's one way to get them and in, 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 uh, to tweak their interests is to have people who hold um, seats to come and visit in classrooms. Um, a lot of times, you know, you hear kids complain about they don't want to be involved. They don't have anything to do with it. They're listless or complacent. 18-year-olds, uh, 17-year-olds coming up on 18, you know, the age to vote. Um, you know, so do you have any advice as far as, you know, somebody who might not have any interest? How do you get them interested? I mean, I think, I mean, interest in voting and, and, and participating in the political process in general, I think it's a cultural question. Okay. Um, some people come from families where that discourse happens mm -hmm. in their homes, around their dinner tables, or in other places within their families. Um, I think that the schools used to be the perfect vehicle um, for those kinds of uh, discussions and also for those types of uh, ideas. I remember when I was in high school, there was a class I took called Law and Individual. Mm -hmm. And basically it was a civics course and it taught you about the, the preamble, the Bill of Rights, the Constitution. I don't know that kids get that now. I think now everything is so focused on teaching to the test. Some of the basic uh, premises that we hold true to our, to our hearts as Americans sort of go to the wayside mm -hmm. because the focus is more about a kid passing the test than this kid becoming this universal citizen. Um, and when you compete with that reality, more and more, I think young people are going to be disconnected from the process. Okay. And if you have any other questions besides what we have left on there, but before we, we do that, mm -hmm. um, you made the statement about uh, having the, the opportunity to serve in the military. Mm -hmm. um, what did you mean by that? What, my opportunity? Or no, 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 I mean about, yeah, well, every, I think that, universally. You know, when we think about, you know, a democracy as ours, and we think about, uh, having the most advanced professional military in the free world, that doesn't happen by accident. That happens by service. And as the body of people shrink 
who are willing to provide that service and step forward and, and volunteer without being drafted. If we start to go into reverse, I think we will see a decline in terms of our, our ability to protect ourselves as a nation. Um, that's why I would certainly advocate for any young person, who, especially for that one who hasn't quite found his or her way yet. Mm -hmm. You know, the military is a perfect opportunity for you to go and find yourself and figure out what you want to do in life. Yeah, there, there will always be the possibility of being deployed someplace, but people die every day on our streets and not have been deployed at one time. So how would you much rather, you know, live your life and, and uh, value your life in terms of if you have to lose your life, I'd much rather lose my life defending something that means something than senselessly sitting on a stoop and some indiscriminate bullet took you out. Okay. Um, let's see. What was it? Uh, <clears throat> Okay, that one. How? How did your service and experiences affect your life? Um, certainly, uh, my service um, affected my life in a couple ways. Um, it made me appreciate more um, the freedoms that we have as Americans. Um, certainly uh, opened up my eyes to the world beyond the United States. Worlds that, or places that I've only known about through books after traveling some of these places, these places literally come alive for you. You can breathe life into these places. You can say now, you can move or transition from saying, I saw that in the book to actually, I experienced that particular country or I experienced this particular location. Um, I had the opportunity to go to the Eagle's Nest, um, which is in Garmisch, um, Hitler's bunker where he actually took his life. You know, I saw all that stuff. Whereas in the, in the past, I only saw it in the books, you know, the Auschwitz. Dock out, all that. So that experience led me to be exposed to things that I never imagined I would ever see in my life. You know the classroom that I met you in? Right. Right? Did you saw those posters on the wall? Mr. North's class? Right. Right, okay. Did you hear him talk about Auschwitz? No, I didn't recall. Just now. No, well, those. Oh, did was, I hear him? Talk? Yes, just what? now. Those were some of the things that he had up posted around the classroom. Mm -hmm. And it's all about how people have been, certain people have been. Um, you know, the oppression, the indignation, the cruelty, mm -hmm. the extermination, that's, that's what he's talking about. He's visited those places where those people were actually yeah. exterminated. Right. They were killed there Ma in mass, mass numbers. Yeah. Okay. All right. Oh. <laughs> well, do you feel that there's anything else that you would like to share with us that you have maybe have not covered? I think it's been pretty comprehensive based on what we came here to do. Um, again, I just think that uh, when we talk about service, I mean, everybody has their own definition of what service means. Um, I just happen to believe that I think that um, in order to remove whatever stigmas that may be connected to serving the United States military as a minority or as an African American, um, I can say that the service definitely benefited me. The Army got a lot of me. But I got a hell of a lot of the army as well. Okay. <laughs>